Yeah, well, I, I, I'm just afraid I haven't read enough of Jingle Song's works to, to, to know how to work with this. <laughs> Do you think perhaps if you had some, some more guidance, you'd be, be able to... On spot guidance. Yeah, it would be of great help. <laughs> The United Nations program, which works in this country, which is set up. It is, it is a tremendous need based upon my next line in the piece will be the crippling sanctions from the United States have made it unable for North Korea to get all of the food to people that need to have food. Okay, I would say hardship, not disaster. Uh, okay. But your call. Let's not my words, United Nations, but I can change it. Um, Okay. Your call, your call. Um, just making an observation. Okay. Um, Although conditions have improved, this country remains. This country is experiencing significant, significant hardship. Okay, fair done. enough, Gunnar. Yes. You have to voluntarily pay for it. Well, the conditions have improved. And I made a mistake. You know, it's insulting to me. When you can hear it, you can Sorry. What? This is not something to. Uh, well, we can all hear it. Yeah, but uh, don't film it. I did an on camera that, that a member of the KFA took exception to. I was discussing the economic conditions in the country. The KFA member thought I went too far. Funny enough, I thought he had a good point. I changed, altered what I said to come up with something a little more concise that read a little better. Uh, didn't think twice about it until afterwards. This member of the KFA reported to the head of the KFA, Alejandro Caldebenos, that I was undermining uh, the DPRK and, uh, and spreading lies, at which point Alejandro took my camera, uh, started screening it, said that he was tired of my lies. He then threatened my life, uh, said that he would track me down, find me no matter where I was, where thousands of his followers would do so. And the next thing I knew, um, my room had been broken into. My tapes were in here. They broke the lock that's down there. They're all gone. They came into my room and broke the lock, and they took everything that we've worked on. And I was effectively, from that point on, replaced under house arrest. So what do you think of the trip so far, Bjorner? Has it been a success? Has it been a success? Do you think? I think that you you have to think that I'm more aggressive than I really am. I don't have anything against you. I didn't intend to stand. Oh. No the, story, the stories that I were going to do, and the stories I'm still hoping to do, assuming my tapes haven't been destroyed, will be better press than, than North Korea has had in such a long time, and it will reach so many people. And I'm telling you, they, 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 you know, from the waterfall to, to the dancing, to things that we've seen, to a group of Western tourists traveling through North Korea, there was going to be so much good that at the line or two, you might take exception to. Which I changed. If this is what it comes down to, when I lose my tapes, or it becomes 
I spent 10 days in North Korea witnessing wonderful sights only at the end of the day to be taken away and burned by a man who's overzealous and not a friend of North Korea and kicked members out of his organization. Like, that's what the story is about. Do you have two seconds, me and you, just private, private for a I, I was eventually asked to apologize for what I had done. It was a very difficult situation. I made my point very clear that I didn't think I had done anything wrong. Um, I was threatened with being detained further in the country. I ultimately worked out an arrangement with the government whereby I told them the words that they wanted to hear and they segregated me from the rest of the group, drove me around the city of Pyongyang in a car by myself this morning uh, and eventually took me to the airport. The official word given was that, that there was some concern that I had been filming military installations that was patently not true. There was nothing on those tapes that was at all that the military stuff. I didn't even want to shoot them because I don't need them because I have tons of file pictures of military. The only military pictures were like out the windows of the occasional stragglers walking. They wanted, the owner told me it was all a setup, that he was, he had planned to get me and that at some point during the week it was going to happen. Regardless of what there was or wasn't on my tape, I'm not going to let anybody censor what I can or can't shoot, but I was playing by whatever rules we were given, um, but they clearly had fabricated a story and had an agenda and, and wanted my tapes. If they gave the tapes back and I explained it to them, I'd, just, I'd forget the whole thing, I'd go back, I'd do my stories, everybody's happy and I swear to them the stories will be good. This way, I mean, why are they so <laughs> stupid? The, the, the really interesting thing, and the reason why I think it's all an Alejandro setup, is that Mr. Kim uh, is the one who I was dealing with throughout yesterday. He was the one who gave me the option to write the letter, or I would be detained and turned over to security forces, kept in the detention that center. That letter was a face saver for Alejandro. That's all that is. Well, listen, listen about the letter. The letter basically, Mr. Kim says, we will only keep this between us. Don't tell anybody in the group. Uh, and I won't tell anybody. I'm thinking, that's weird. Why would he keep it to himself? When I got to the airport today, I noticed I was taken in separately in a black car with you know, <laughs> black windows and driven around, driven around in circles, actually, for a while first before we went to the airport. And then when we got there, Mr. Uh, Liu, the fat man who sat in the front of the bus, yeah, he and I had gotten along great earlier in the week, so he saw me. I hadn't seen him in days. He's smiling. He's waving at me. And I'm looking at him like, with this somber face, and he sort of says, what's wrong? And Mr. Lee comes over and says, Mr. Lee, does he not know what happened? And Mr. Lee asks, he had no idea. He's Mr. Kim's boss, he had, unless he's lying, he had no idea. Which means the whole thing, Alejandro could have had the tapes the whole time, uh, that it could have just been him and Mr. Kim playing along, because Mr. Kim would only talk about those concerned. I said, who are those concerned? He'd say, intelligence agents but very vague. And I said, so you need to let the Korean government could have no idea what happened. This is happening. Potentially. That's, That's what. That's fascinating. Yeah. <coughs> That's scary. The one tape I did save, funny enough, is I had the interview with Mr. Kim. It was in my bag. They asked me for today's tapes, and that happened to be in my bag, and it was shot the day before. So I didn't give it to them. And it wasn't in my room when they broke in and stole everything. So the one thing I have is a shot of me walking with the guy who basically forced me to write the confession. And <laughs> so it's all on him. So he could be headed to the gulag pretty soon.
of sand, if you will, where they will not move from. So I think what you have are two sides which are not seeing the other side's point of view at this point, and that's led largely to a stalemate, Mr. Lee. Is it okay that I press break a button? Yeah, I saw you recording, the light was on. <laughs>